Media Productions and Black Star News welcome you all to Carrying Forth the Torch, a celebration of Black History Month in memory of Honorable John Robert Lewis and the Queen Cicely Tyson. This event is in solidarity with our African-American brothers and sisters, and most symbolically in recognition of the battle fought by our enslaved forebears. So we African immigrants can dream of coming to America. They endured so we can breathe and continue to build and conquer. We celebrate this Black History Month in solidarity with our African-American brothers and sisters. Together, we're stronger. Together, we will build a better, unified, peaceful, and equitable world for all. On that note, I would like to welcome His Royal Majesty. I don't want to, uh, let me just get your name correctly here. And I should, because I'm Yoruba and I don't want to pronounce your name <laughs> incorrectly. That would be really uh, not a good thing. Okay, I would like to work for the libation. We're starting this event with an invocation on a libation ceremony. Uh, unfortunately, His Imperial Majesty King Adeyeye is not able to join us on this occasion. But in his place, we have his Royal Highness, Oba Adekunle, Aderomu, Oba Oboni Iwashe. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. So, so I'm please, very delighted to be here. Okay. Thank you. You can introduce yourself briefly, um, uh, His Royal Highness, and okay. then you know, start the libation for us. Thank okay, you. I'm, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm very, very pleased to be part of this important occasion that promotes our heritage in right there in the United States of America. My name is, is Aurora uh, Ines Oba Adekunle Aderomu, the Oni Washe of Washe, the Oboni worldwide. So I am presently here in Brazil and I'm the president, president of African Cultural Center promoting African culture around the world. And I'm very, very happy to be part of this occasion. And uh, I would love to open the prayer with our ancestors, uh, what, which is in Yoruba, because that is the, the language that we hope to, prom uh, to start promoting anywhere from now. I know people over there speak uh, English, but because you are part of us, and uh, I want our ancestors to be uh, to be within us right from now to open the prayer. So that's why I'm going to do the prayer in Yoruba. So I will start by glorifying God Almighty by saying Olo du mari ipa, Olo du mari ipa, Olo jo niba, Olo jo niba, ifa mujuba, ifa mujuba asheda mujuba, ishula ngu giri mosheba tini. Ishulango <laughs> Kori kodo, tin ru mini mini, iwa ni bo mbo na, iyi tin le buru koko, buru koko, buru koko, o gumwa gwe wani bi koko, ikaka teji ori gi, awo lu ori, edon yi lu ori, amon bi ogon omo o bo to gon, o gwen anon fara tara dan, o gwen anon fwa joro, fwa joro suwa, o gwen anon fwa joro, gwen le la, o gwen le la, wa la so, o la so la, la se la, la se li bo bo, o gwen ye mo ye, o gwen ye mo ye, chango lu koso la do, ke kun, Oba si do ta shegun la dudu la kiyo eri ina oba je ni mo ni koto pa ni ebiti kawo pe isoro aseba tin o oya oriri mo se ba tin yin egungun inu afefe mo se ba egungun inu afefe mo se ba tin yin oya oriri osun ose ngese mo se ba oloyi ayin ota o omi o agba o awa mama fi mo je tosun o ebora ma pe ni mo awa mama fi mo je tosun ebora ma pe ni mo Oshun ori ye ye o, oshun ori ye ye o, oni bo o wo, o fide we mo, o fide a karaka mo shen ge she, da kun da bo ko fi e de nou, oshun o shen ge she, da kun da bo ko fi e de nou, ko fi e de kuku wala, nou tu wofka te kadolou, kadolola, kawa diolola kadoni lo robo. Mo a di ba ye mi a je, mo di ba ye mi o shonu nige, en la ke shoro, en la fo shoro, en la fo shoro, shoro wadu, 
erin to bo mo je en la fi du eye iti fora kin ra kin ra kin loju o wa do wo ti o orun mi la ba ra gbon mi rigun baba le ti oye mu ke ba ti o ni ni ti sawo lo ni ara do ero ife ara imoran won ro bi ojumo tin wa saye oju ni de du orun olokun se ni age ifa olokun asoro jijo ifa olokun asoro ke wa soro gbogbo wa jijo ke soro ti gbogbo di ayo le ni o gbogbo awon si ojo mo yin to wa ni bi gbogbo agbaye ni oridede america ni o ni oridede nigeria ni o ni oridede ile gesi ni o gbogbo ibi kibi ti awon mo yin ba ti wa le ni ti won se iran ti yin ti won se iran ti yin ke wa dabo wi po won o ke da so ke da bo wi po won o e ma oju won ko ri bi mo o ato tun ato si owa oju awa o mama ni kri bi awa mama ti to mo n bara re te ati se bu se te ku a se bu se te arun a se se te pe a se se ti se ti se e ma e ka wo rogun ni le nigeria to gun se wa je ma e ka rogun be o ani rogun ile america o ani rogun ile brazil ti mo wa yi o ke wa da gbo gbo awon mo yin da ku da do gbo aye da ki da gbo e to da america ni o e to je omo mexico ni o e to je omo ti brazil bi na ni o ke wa da gbo gbo lati ni lo ati ti lai lai olodumare ase ase ti wo ifa ase ti wo orun mela ase ti olodumare olodumare ase o i'm very very happy to be with you now that we have been able to call our ancestors to come and be with this meeting i i am very very sure that everything will be in order and uh, i hope in future we we'll be able to do this meeting uh, uh, physically and be able to know more, more of you people over there because we are promoting the same thing like i am promoting african culture here and the tradition here and uh, we hope to work together in uh, i hope to partner with you people in america very soon thank you very much and uh, i wish you well thank you very much Hi, Nath. We appreciate you joining us. I'm sure you're going to hang around, right? Please stay with us okay. for a few more minutes, okay? Oh, I will. I will. Thank, thank you so much uh, again, everyone, for joining. This is a historical event, and I'm really grateful. United African Coalition, Black Star News, African Diaspora for Good Governance, Global Media Productions. We're really happy that you guys hit the call when we ask, we ask you to join this event not too long ago. As we do everything these days, we can't plan ahead, right? God is in control. So on that note, I'd like to introduce uh, Charles Cooper to give an uh, opening remarks. Charles Cooper is the uh, chair, the chairman of the United African Coalition, which was founded in 2013. We, we get into that in a bit, but Charles, please give us uh, opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Bokola. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dignitaries, um, elected officials and guests. Um, I want to thank everybody um, who's here this afternoon, uh, folks uh, watching on Zoom, um, YouTube, Facebook, and other social media platforms. I want to give a special thanks to our president, uh, Bukola Shola, for organizing this event. Um, we at UNAC, uh, we are very lucky uh, as an organization to have someone so passionate and dedicated uh, to the mobilization of black and brown people on the continent and in a diaspora. Uh, we are here today to celebrate um, Black History Month and the legacy of John Lewis and Cicely Tyson. As we are all aware, Black history is American history. Um, it was the labor of Black people um, that created the economic engine that we see America is today. Uh, but Black history is also African history. Um, it's a story of a resilient people that refuse to relent even in the most grotesque, barbaric environment as slavery was um, in America. Um, and in the night um, when hope was bleak and the cries of our people um, could no longer bear. Uh, we were gifted leadership uh, for which today uh, we stand on their shoulders. Um, leadership such as 
Harriet Tubman, um, leaderships such as uh, Sir Joyner Truth, uh, leaderships such as Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Farrakhan, Fred Hampton, and many, many, many more. Um, these individuals um, spoke truth to power and they sacrificed their liberties in order for us to have ours. And as long as we are out in our communities, continuing to fight for social and economic equity, um, not just every February, but year round, I have no doubt that we will live up to the promise and dreams of our great leaders and ancestors. Um, in addition, as uh, black and brown people have continued to move America um, in the right direction, uh, we will continue to move this great country uh, to live up to the founding fathers adage um, that all men are created equal that they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank um, everyone um, for um, participating and um, attending this event this afternoon. Um, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, Mark, what's the next on our agenda? They don't have that screen up. Certainly. Um, we have an introduction to session two. Okay. The screen. Should have this printed out, but I don't have it printed out. I'm so sorry. What is section, what is the first page on that section two? What is, what is? So we have uh, an introduction by you, our moderator, and then we're going to have some some clips uh, of his royal of his uh, of his Majesty. Right. So again, thank you. You're welcome. This event means so much to me, on a personal note. When I was growing up in Nigeria in the '60s and early '70s, I did not know anything about slavery. There was no, nothing in our textbooks, elementary school through secondary school for me, there was nothing that mentioned slavery. There was nothing that mentioned that we have African-American ancestors somewhere on the planet. And that's shocking, you know, because that has to be some sort of coordinated, you know, uh, uh, plan to make sure that we are not knowledgeable, to make sure that we're not educated about how people and how our people have been oppressed and how they have been brutalized. So nothing of that, I, I was just really shocked that there was nothing like that. And also, I remember when I was in boarding school, I would have, you know, my sisters had friends, so I, I had access to jet magazines. And I would take those magazines, I'll pull out pages from them. I'll paste them on my dorm, dormitory wall uh, in my dorm room claiming these people in the magazine with their Afro and the hot pants. And I would claim them as my, my sisters or my brothers. And my classmates would tell me, no, they're not. Their names are Johnson and Williams and um, you name it, all the American names. So, and I would say, oh yeah, I know, but, they, but they're my brothers and sisters. And this was just, we're just joking around, mind you. We didn't, I didn't really know that these were our brothers and sisters that were kidnapped and brutalized and taken to another part of the world. So I was just claiming them as my brothers and sisters. So it wasn't until, and one more anecdote, and this is, should be embarrassing, but I'm not because I just didn't know. When the movie Roots came out, believe this or not, we thought that was just fiction. There was no understanding that that was an historical fiction. We thought it was just drama. We didn't know that it was actually depicting real life experiences. So here we are today that our African-Americans brothers and sisters, we're here in America. We came here 
we bought our old ticket, we got on a flight, we got visa, we came here dreaming of the America that we did not know that our, our ancestors have fought, our forebears have fought so that we can breathe. So this is what this event means to me personally. And United African Coalition, Black Star News, Global Media Production, African Diaspora for Good Governance, these are all African immigrant founded organizations. So we, we are doing these to show that we have the connection, to show that we understand, to show that we appreciate what African-Americans have done, so our brothers and sisters, our ancestors have done for us to pave the way so that we can be easy and feel. So this is so important to me. Uh, and this is why we're here. So thank you so much again for joining. Uh, I have to pull up this calendar, which I'm still having issues with. Let's see. Okay, now I have it, thank you. So next, we have our first speaker, Charles Joseph, I mean, one second. I'm in section two. Okay. Right, Mark. So please help me out when I'm trying to kind of like uh, tap my brain and kind of coordinate my brain in other words. So the next, the next agenda on, the, on this program is the video clips from the, from the King. And also the interview I did with the King at the Foreign Press Center in New York when he came here in uh, 2016. So Mac, please go ahead. But African-Americans and the entire Africa as a whole, be it Caribbean, be it from North America, be it from South America, from Asia, from Middle East, from Europe, we are all one in the presence of our creator, the God that we serve. I am almighty, I am that I am. Please, if you are happy today, I want your fist again in the air. Say, Adu Day. <laughs> and today, he has actually shown off a very mysterious sign that is in our midst. I want everybody to raise their fist up and look up. You will see at the same time, moon coming out, and at the same time, the sun coming out. Look up, you will see the moon. Can you see a great sign? And you see the sun still shining. Can you see both shining, coming up at the same time? Was well, the video uh, freezing? Or something? Oh, I didn't know we had left. Okay. Turn to the audio. Hello. I think we just lost the audio, right? Say that again? Yeah, did we lose the audio, Mac? Uh, I don't believe so. Is everyone else hearing it okay? No. Oh, Are no. you guys hearing it? No. No, so they're not hearing it. They so. don't hear it? Okay. Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's try it again. African Americans. How's that? Very good. So it's, can you, it's still freezing. Okay. From Europe, we are all one in the presence of our creator, the God that we serve. I am almighty, I am that I am. Please, if you are happy today, I want your fist again in the air. Say, Adu Day. And today, he has actually shown off a very mysterious sign that is in our midst. I want everybody to raise their fist up and look up. You will see at the same time, moon coming out and at the same time, the sun coming out. Look up, you will see the moon. Can you see a great sign? And you see the sun still shining. Can you see both shining coming up at the same time? It is not ordinary. It's a mysterious happening. It doesn't happen every time. If you are happy, say or do they one more time? Today I want to pray for all of us. But African American, we have the same. 
and marinerism, our thought process, our thinking faculty is the same. Humanity started from us. Do you believe it? Say yes if you believe it. Today, our ancestors will hear all your prayers. As I'm talking, be saying, I'll share. Our ancestors will meet all of you at the point of your needs. Say, I'll share. All the desires of your heart. Our ancestors, God Almighty that we serve, will make sure that everything become a reality. Say, I'll share. Everything you lay your hands upon from today ends forth, from today onwards, God Almighty, our ancestors will continue to be with all of you. Say, I share. God Almighty that created all of us, we will continue to know peace. From today and forever, say Asher. Asher. There will be peace at every corner of this world. From the north, there will be peace, say Asher. Asher. From the south, there will be peace, say Asher. Asher. From the east, there will be peace, say Asher. Asher. From the west, there will be peace, say Asher. Asher. And right from the center, where all humanity came from, which is Africa, that is the center of the world. There will be peace at the center. Say, I share. The peace of the center is much more paramount because the center has all the strength. The center has the strength of everything. The center must be at peace. And when the center is at peace, the entire world will be at peace. Going forward from today, there will be peace at the center. Say, Asher. Asher. Our ancestors have answered our prayers today and forever. Say, Asher. Asher. And God Almighty, our Creator, has answered our prayer. Say, Asher. Asher. Now, if you know you're happy, I want you to sing this song. So this video uh, was my interview with the king, as I said earlier, when he came here in 2016. Just a short <clears throat> clip. My name is Bukola Shonuga, and I have the honor, it's really a, a, a great pleasure. I couldn't even begin to express how I feel to be sitting here with this Imperial Majesty, Oba Adeyeye Eniton, Obuwusi Ojoja II, Oni Ofife. When you were in Seoul last year in December, I'm not sure how much the world knew who you were, but as soon as you were crowned, it's like something just happened around the world. You ignited something that I have never seen before. And especially in the social media platform, what brought you to the United States, Your Majesty? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would give all the honor, all the glory, and all the adoration to the King of Kings, the Supreme Being, for making today another memorable day. Um, I give all the glory to, to him because he's the author and finisher of everything. So um, the objective of um, our mission is to revive and revamp our heritage, our culture, and our tradition all over the world. Not only the Yoruba race, but the entire black race. It's very important for us to unite and come together as a formidable force and uh, try and remember 
bind each and every body that belongs to the black, black race, that we have things in common, irrespective of our countries. At some point, there were no boundaries of countries in the midst of all of us. All of us that came out of continent of Africa, our colonial masters put the boundaries. So it's very important for us to remember our joy of origination, where we all came from. It's very important for us to know that our culture is still intact, to know that our tradition is still intact and our heritage is still intact. And um, above all, we have a very strong and formidable kingship system. And uh, that has been in existence for hundreds of thousands of years all over the continent of Africa. We need to let the world know that the kingship system is still intact. It is very good for community development. It is there to support the government and the governance in the entire Africa as a whole. So we came again for something very important in the United States of America. Okay, is that the end of that clip? Right. Okay, all right. Next on the agenda is uh, Milton Alemadi. Uh, Milton is the publisher of Black Star News for about two decades now. He's also a professor at John Jay College and a wealth of knowledge. You know, Milton is uh, originally from Uganda, so he's one of the brain in, brains in our community, as an African, uh, the African immigrant community. I wouldn't just say represent the African immigrant. Milton is just a powerful, you know, a powerhouse. Thank you so much, Milton, for joining us. Please go ahead. At least you can better introduce yourself by didn't do a good job. <laughs> no, I think you did a good job. First, I want to thank you. I want to thank Charles Cooper. I want to thank United African Coalition for putting together this uh, very historic event to honor the legacy of a great freedom fighter, rep the late Representative John Lewis, and also the legacy, of course, of uh, uh, our queen, Cicely Tyson. Uh, John Lewis spoke about good trouble. And I think it's important for us to inspire young people to always get, in, get involved in trouble, good trouble. Trouble when directed and focused toward the liberation of African peoples, fighting injustice all over the world. I would like to take a Pan-African approach and make very good use of my five minutes allotted to me. Representative John Lewis was inspired by Africa. Many people are not aware that in the 1960s, he actually traveled to Africa as part of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They visited several African countries, including Guinea, including Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, and a number of other African countries. And how did they find this very inspiring? They were inspired, as he later recalled, to see Black women and Black men running the affairs of these new nations. Of course, this was during the period of African decolonization, when Africans were winning their freedom from European colonial rule and exploitation. And he found this very empowering in terms of motivating him in his involvement in the civil rights struggle, struggle here in the United States. There are many diaspora Africans, descendants of Africa, who were inspired by Africa. And there are many Africans who were also inspired by African descendants in the United States. Many people are not aware that Kwame Nkrumah, who became the first prime minister and later president of Ghana, was greatly inspired by the black struggle in the United States. Kwame Nkrumah, of course, went to an HBCU. He went to Lincoln University and later the University of Pennsylvania. He lived in Harlem in the summers, so experienced firsthand the racism that Sister and Brothers were enduring, experiencing in the United States. And on the occasion of Ghana's independence, he invited Dr. King who was only 27 years old at the time. But of course, Nkrumah 
being intimately aware of the struggle in the United States, was aware of this young emerging leader, Dr. King, and invited him to come to celebrate Ghana's independence celebration. The United States, of course, was represented on that occasion by then Vice President Richard Nixon. Dr. King, when he returned, he made a great speech that I greatly encourage people to listen to. It's on YouTube. It's called The Birth of a New Nation. And in that tremendous speech, he summarizes the African experience with enslavement, with colonialism, and then ultimately the emergence of nations such as Ghana and other African countries. During his trip to Africa, Representative John Lewis, then a young man, of course, was also asked many countries where he visited about Malcolm X, because Malcolm X was, of course, also emerging on the world stage at that time as a great leader against injustices in the United States. And, of course, Malcolm also got to, lead, to meet leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah. And Malcolm himself, in his own diaries, recalled how important it was to be inspired by Africa and the rise of nationalism in Africa. And he said that was greatly empowering for the Black struggle in the United States. Of course, John Lewis got to meet Malcolm on the eve of the March on Washington. They came from different philosophical approaches, one nonviolence, the other by any means necessary. But their objective was the same the total liberation of African descendants in the United States. There are many, many African descendants who contributed to the struggle in Africa. I don't have the time to name all of them, but we have to recall people like Randall Robinson of Trans-Africa, who made the divestment campaign against apartheid in South Africa Everybody got to know about the apartheid campaign and young people, students became involved in the resistance against apartheid in South Africa. And that contributed tremendously, ultimately to the liberation of Nelson Mandela from incarceration and the end of formal apartheid in South Africa. So the time is limited. I would like to wrap on a note about why it is very important for us to teach our young people Pan-Africanism and the power of knowing about their history and culture. I teach at John Jay, as you mentioned. There is one lesson in particular that my students take with them. They leave that class completely transformed as human beings. How is that so? They learn that without Africa, there would be no other history because all human beings originated in Africa. They learn about the remains of Dinkanesh, discovered in 1974 in Ethiopia, dating back 3.2 million years old. They learn that had Africans not migrated from the continent and settled other parts of the world, there would be no other races. In any event, race is a social construction. We are all descendants of the original human beings, and all of us were Africans. It is only after they disperse to other parts of the world that due to climactic and environmental uh, conditions, people took on the different features that we see today. But in essence, we are all the same. We are all Africans. When we say we're all Africans, it does not have just a theoretical meaning. It is an actual meaning behind it. And when our young people get to know that knowledge, they are tremendously informed. They become much more empowered they expect much more of themselves. So I would like to conclude by saying this. This is a great event that you put together today. I hope to see it as an annual event. And every year when we meet to celebrate the legacy of the great John Lewis and Sissy Tyson, we also talk about the importance of making that pan-African connection between the motherland and Africans all over the diaspora whether it's in North America, whether it's in, in Brazil, as the, the, the brother who opened the event today uh, showed us the importance of Africans in Brazil as well. So that would be my hope that this becomes an annual event. I thank you once again for making me a part of 
this Thank event. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Milton. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you. The next presenter is uh, Chuk Elionu. Chuk is the executive director at uh, African Diaspora for Good Governance. Chuk, are you on? Yes, uh, thank okay. you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shonuga, and thanks, uh, fellow panelists and uh, invited guests. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I am with the African Diaspora for Good Governance. And as the name indicates, we are an African diaspora group. And I believe uh, Buki touched a little bit on us as African diasporans uh, now living in the US, uh, participating in the franchise and making sure that our folks uh, get what they want. Um, so it's a pleasure to be celebrating Black History Month uh, with you. Um, I feel very strongly that Black History Month should not be just an African-American thing. Uh, we, the African diasporans, should also uh, make very strong concerted effort to celebrate it. So what I'm about to say ties back to that and in honor of uh, commemoration of John Lewis, whom we are also celebrating as part of this. Um, so as you know, the great writer uh, from Nigeria, Chinua Achebe, uh, did say that the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunters unless and until lions get their own historians. It's a very, very in, uh, informative uh, quote in the sense that as children, we learn history and everything we've read in history, whether you went to school in Africa, in the Caribbean, anywhere else in the world, including here in the United States. The history that you read are often written by white men. Therefore, all the stories in those history books often glorify white men and women. They often never tell you the true original story. So for those of us who are parents, especially the immigrant parents, we often have to struggle with uh, trying to bring our children up to speed. I know my kids come home sometimes all excited and they'll say something and I'll say, well, that's not entirely true. And I will teach them or at least try to instruct them on some of the background uh, facts that led up to that. So the United States today is the most powerful country in the world. Uh, unfortunately, the event on January 6th here in Washington DC made a disgrace of that claim, but Nonetheless, it is still a very powerful country. Though a powerful country it may be, I want to claim that America would not be as powerful as it is if it were not for African-Americans. And when I say African-Americans here, I mean our African-American forefathers, right? Um, some of the Prior speakers, uh, Charles Cooper uh, and uh, Melton, uh, have already touched on some of those names, right? W.E.B. Du Bois, I'll add to that list, Booker T. Washington, right? Uh, someone already mentioned Harriet Tubman, of course, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis himself, and many, many others. If it were not for them, I can guarantee you that America will not be as powerful as it is. Why? Because the same white people that are running Europe were the ones who came here, right? So if they knew all these things, why didn't they do it where they came from? So it wasn't until the 1600s and the 1700s when Africans were stolen from their motherland and brought over here as slaves that there were transformation. So in commemoration to Black history, uh, whenever I get the invitation to speak at Black History Month events, I try to focus it back to Africa, right? Yes, I know a lot of us want to talk about African-Americans, but you guys keep forgetting African-Americans are Africans. They are Africans. And that's why that word Africa uh, is inserted there. Africa has contributed a lot to the United States. And what Africa has contributed to the United States is often overlooked in the race to do other things to undermine Africa itself. 
So as I said, back in the 1600s till today, there are lots of things Africa has contributed. So let me give you 10 of them. Um, most of you know about the American cowboy. Everybody knows about the American cowboy. Did you know that the cowboys actually are black people, they were Africans. Back in the 1600s, there were no such thing as a white cowboy. They were all Africans. They brought that tradition and that concept to the America. And in, in addition, how about cattle, right? I uh, have a lot of friends in Texas, uh, Montana, some of those uh, places that value cattle. Well, the first longhorn cattle actually came from Africa, right? So folks from uh, North Africa via Senegambia and uh, uh, Cape Verde were some of the very first earliest Africans to set foot here in America. And something they do not teach you in American history is that some of the early Africans that came to America were actually not slaves, right? Why does the American history always talk about 1600s? How about the 1500s? How about the 1400s? They were blacks here then. They were not slaves. So there are lots of things we brought. How about rice farming? The white man did not know how to farm for rice. They almost died after the Mayflower, right? The Native Americans can only do potatoes and, and a few other little uh, crops. It was Africans when they came here that brought rice farming, a tradition that is till today uh, uh, cultivated in the country of Madagascar. Um, foods, most of you eat okra, black eyed peas, lima beans, kidney beans. The white man never saw any of those things until Africans set foot on this continent. Um, before fridge or refrigerators were invented, how did you think? Africans preserved their food. Well, deep frying, you know, everybody goes to Kentucky Fried every now and then, five finger licking good chicken. Well, Africans knew since the days of Jesus Christ that when you deep fry meats and you deep fry certain food, that is a way to preserve them without refrigeration. And there's still some food in my house today that my kids are surprised we don't need refrigeration for. You just have to do certain things to keep them preserved. Uh, six, herbal medicine, right? Sure, we, everybody's talking about Pfizer right now and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. But before all those companies came, Africans brought herbal medicine. And working with their Native American counterparts were able to save a lot of lives before any, a lot of invention. And on top of that, inoculation. Most of us go to the hospital today to get inoculated or injected with vaccines. That actual process and practice came from Africa. Ancient Egyptians used to do it long before the white man ever knew how to do that. How about the game of chess? Today, we think chess is a game exclusive to only white upper class. No, actually, it is an African game. You can go back to the pyramids of Egypt and you will see diagrams, murals on the walls of the pyramid depicting the pharaohs and their wives <clears throat> playing chess. Polyrhythmic music, right? From country music to bluegrass to R&B, except for rap, all music in America originated from Africa. Don't, let, don't say trickster, but it is the truth. Last but not the least, which is the tent. Since we are celebrating Black History Month, I wanted to also make sure that we give credit that Africa brought its own people both free and slaves to come here to help America. Contrary to what the history books has, Africa never sold anybody. Americans came and stole them from us, raped them, beat them, enslaved them. That's not our history from Africa. Nobody was sold. It's Americans that turned it into a business. But on that note, we in the African diaspora for good governance, want to continue to highlight that despite decades, centuries of subjugation of mm -hmm. African-American brothers and sisters, we, the diasporans, are here now to work with you, to join forces with you, and to help not only in the resistance, but in the liber liberation of the minds, right? Most Africans are now free, but the minds are still colonized, and we need to liberate that. And I say amen. Thanks, uh, Mr. Shonuga, for having me. Amen to that. 
Hello. Next on the agenda, we are going to play a couple of video clips celebrating uh, Congressman John Lewis and the Queen, Cecilia Tyson. Yep, those are our clips. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Ray McGuire. Ray is a uh, candidate for the New York City mayoral race. To introduce Ray, I have Dana Reed. Dana is an impact investor and an advisor with 25 years of ex experience in financial services. She's co-founder and CEO of Iansapo Impact Capital, an investment advisory firm specializing in African SMEs. Dana, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Dana, are you there? Dana's on mute. Dana, hi, you hi. I'm here. Thank you. Um, just Bukola Ray's in the waiting room, if you could let him in. Um, but I was just saying good afternoon to everyone. Bukola, thank you always for putting on such great events, bringing the diaspora together, which is so important to me as an African-American. We are one. Um, and in, in light of uh, Black History Month, to me, every day is Black History Month. I am... Um, ecstatic to, to introduce you guys to Ray McGuire, who um, is somebody that I have looked up to professionally. Um, he is our most senior um, African-American on Wall Street, but um, he's just one of the most senior people on Wall Street as well. So we have all looked up to him. Um, what a lot of people don't know about Ray is in addition to his um, financial um, expertise, he is a man um, of the community, for the community, by the community. Um, and he is really looking forward to having these discussions going forward um, with the diaspora because we are truly one. And I'm looking forward, um, you know, to I, this is not a political event, but I do support his mayoral race. Um, I'm looking forward to having um, such business acumen in our city, in our neighborhoods, um, because we certainly need it. And so I'm hoping that Ray is on. I can't see. Um, Mac, is Ray on? Ray uh, Bukul, if he's in the waiting room, you should be able to see him as the call host. Yeah, he's in the waiting room. So let's okay. um, the And so that's what I was saying. As we talk about bringing the diaspora together, they've tried so many years to separate us. I enjoy these forums because um, they can't separate us. And we also, um, we need to support our leaders and we need to be involved in our processes because we do get to pick and choose. So when we show up, um, we're showing up for our families and, and our future. With that, I'm hoping that Ray is in now. Just one moment, please. Okay. Thanks, Mac. Absolutely. There we go. Good afternoon, Ray. Good Safe afternoon, how are you? In the neighborhood, we're good. I am out and about, forgive me. <laughs> Absolutely, so I just introduced you, so you're ready to go. I know you're running a tight schedule, um, getting to Queens to speak to our, our people out there. So you've got the floor. Thank you, thank you so much, United African Communities. And special thanks to Dana and Bucola. I am honored to be here with our colleagues, brethren from the continent. I have spent time I've spent time on the continent uh, supporting leadership from Ghana to Nigeria to South Africa to Rwanda. I'm honored to be here. And what I recognize on this journey is that the opportunity exists for us, especially now, to come together in ways that we have historically not been together. We have talked about it. We haven't been about it. And so as I think about my days from from Dayton, Ohio, raised by a single mother, across the streets from a paper mill, my single mother was a, was, a, was a social worker and she raised me and my two brothers and gave me the opportunity to leave my neighborhood and walk three quarters of a mile to a mile to get to a corner that the bus picked me up to take me to a school in the suburbs. And I did that from sixth grade to 11th grade. In 11th grade, I had a 4.0 average. I was 28 points per game playing basketball. I was president of the school. The teacher said, if you're as good as they say you are, why don't you go and test yourself against the big boys and girls in the East? I said, where are they? 
So I took a Greyhound bus around New England by myself at 16, looking for the big girls and boys in the East and did okay, landed at a school in Connecticut called Hotchkiss. I was there for a year and did okay, applied to six colleges, got in, and then went on to Harvard College and then on a law school and business school. And I started in New York. I had three things. I had a great education. I had a lot of debt and I had no money. And it was there that I began my journey in business where I was fortunate to be able to lead a global business, global corporate and investment banking business that had responsibility for all of our activity in North America, in South America, and in the continent, on the continent. So I have been fortunate to understand the power of the relationships between the continent and between the West. And that power is now being exhibited in so many different forums. It's being exhibited in business. It's being exhibited mostly in business and hopefully even more in art. There was not so long ago, a opening of a great Nigerian art dealer in Los Angeles, which is now post of the Relay Gallery, Mrs. Sono, Sono Riro. And so I look, at, I look at relationships like that. And I look at the power of that through art, through business, through the relationships that we have in education. And I look at the demographic trends and the growth that's taking place on the continent. And I look at the leaders who, who were on the continent and who are here now and the relationships that are only growing stronger. And I'll give you evidence of one whom, on whom shoulders I stand, one Franklin A. Thomas, whom you may or may not know. But Franklin Thomas started the Bedford Stuy Restoration Corporation. He led the Ford Foundation. And Franklin Thomas was one who negotiated the peace in South Africa between de Klerk, de Bota, and Mandela. And it's on his shoulders. He is my mentor. I do nothing without speaking to Franklin A. Thomas. So if there's any evidence of the power of the relationship between the continent and the people who are here, that reflects the power, which is a long-standing power. And together we rise. So as I am on my journey to lead this city in the greatest, most inclusive comeback in the history of this great city, at its core is the deep relationship that exists between the brethren and the sistren on the continent and here. So I am honored to be able to have a little time with you. I say thank you for all the great leadership and for this convening and may it just begin be, be the beginning of that much more. And I look for your support. I look forward to your support. And when I get to Gracie Mansion, I look to make certain that you're there with me in all the brilliant colors and all the rich culture that represent the journey from there to here. We wouldn't be here without each other. So thank you all so very much for having me. I am deeply honored to be with you. And I'm so, so, so encouraged by the promise of the future that rests in the rich tradition of the past that got us all here, especially me. So thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of the conference. I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much, Ray. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by. All the best. And, and still I rise. I love the book there. All thank right. you, Bacola. And still I rise. Thank Amen. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So next on the agenda, on the program rather, is uh, Assemblyman Charles Fall. Is Charles on? I think he might be running a little bit behind. Um, well, I see, I don't see up. him in the... Uh... Okay, so we're gonna move right along. What about Senator Kevin Parker? Senator Parker, are you here? I think we should okay, have Mr. Ross. Take Mr. Ross. He killed it. Okay, I know I should be able to see who's on. I don't see him on this roster here. Um, okay, maybe they're running behind schedule. Let's see who. Mario, Mario, are you there? I think you came in actually early. Mario, are you on? Okay, so yes, I'm I'm on. 
Thank you. Thank yes. you, brother. Thank you for joining us. Such a pleasure to, to have you. It's good to be here. It's good to so, be here. Mario Rosa is uh, a city council candidate and is actually representing my, my district. So it's good to have you on. Please uh, go ahead and uh, talk to us. What does this uh, in Story Day represent to you? The month, rather. Right. Well, thank you, Bacola. And uh, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to address this important convening in a moment of great weight in our history as a people. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Mario Rosser. Uh, I am a candidate for city council uh, here in New York to represent Central Harlem, my community, our community, your community. Uh, and with, with God's grace uh, and the hard work of our team, Come June 2021, we will be victorious. Uh, you know, today we come together to commemorate our journey as Black people. Um, I think of my late grandfather, Luther J. Harris. He was born in 1927 uh, in Mississippi to a sharecropping family. Uh, when he was born in 1927, uh, that state was over 60% black people, but not a single one of them could vote. He was born into a system of economic ex exploitation that ultimately drove him to leave the state of Mississippi and seek a better life here in the North. You know, my grandfather was the firstborn. He left his mother, he left his father, he left all his brothers and sisters, and he sacrificed everything so that I could be here today and speak with you all. And I'm so honored for this opportunity that he was able to give me. Our ancestors are watching us closely right now. They're watching us closely in this moment of great loss to see what we have learned, we must honor them. You know, growing, growing up, I, I was blessed to have a mother who frankly taught me to embrace and study my African heritage, despite being a black American. My ancestors came to this country 400 years ago, but my mom told me never to forget where we came from. From an early age, I learned about the kingdoms and empires that governed West Africa long before Europeans ever arrived. The kingdoms of Mali, the kingdoms of Songhai, the kingdoms of Benin. But I, I also learned about the tragedy that brought us here. You know, um, I'll never forget when I was uh, young and I was old enough, I guess, for my mom to let me watch the movie Roots. Um, I will never forget the scene in which uh, Kuta Kinte uh, was abducted and ultimately in a rush ended up on the bottom of that ship that enslaved our ancestors. You know, one thing that stood out to me about that particular experience was as they began to try to communicate with each other, they're on the ship and everyone is speaking different languages because of course people have been brought from various tribes and ethnic groups, but they're all on that ship together. And they come, they end up in America still not speaking a common language. And that became the birth of our identity as Black Americans. Out of many, Black Americans became one and united the people of a vast region. You know, in that, Somewhere along the way, we became disconnected from the reality that 
the continent is where we come from. There's been too much division in our communities. There has been too much, uh, too much, uh, too many instances in which we have not always supported each other. And that goes both ways. Our ancestors are watching us closely right now. What must we do? By strengthening our diasporic bonds at this time, particularly at this moment, we can create a better future. Um, you know, when I think about my community in Harlem, Harlem is really a dream community for this. You know, what would Harlem be without our Senegalese community, our Malian community, our Guinean communities, the Francophone community? What will Harlem be without these communities? That is what Harlem is today. Obviously, Harlem has a incredibly rich culture and heritage as a, as a bastion of Black American culture and West Indian culture. But Harlem is a dream community today because where else can you find such a blend of the diaspora of our African communities, our Black American communities, our West Indian communities? We are all here together today in Harlem. It is a true, it is a true gift. And in this moment, we must capitalize upon this gift that we have in order to answer the challenges that we're facing today as a neighborhood in which a record number of businesses have closed, a disproportionate number of them in our community, black owned businesses, in which our people are literally lined up today to get food in food pantry lines. We must come together as a community and recognize the only path forward is together and by strengthening our diasporic bonds. Today, as a candidate for city council, I want you all to know that I am here to strengthen those bonds. There's specific work that we need to get done, work that's building upon the advocacy that this organization has been engaged with long before I was even born. I'm young, but I know what it took for us to get here and I respect where we've come from. We need to do everything we can as a city to support vendors and traders and folks who go to market to make the, doing business in Harlem easier for them. That's a unique thing that Harlem brings to the table, our market culture. We need to do everything that we can to make Harlem a beacon of a neighborhood that supports and embraces and accelerates the pathway to success for our Black African immigrant community. We need to increase support for immigration services and support for, uh, for ID cards so that people are integrated into this city, into American society more easily and can live out the dreams that brought them there from far cultures, from far shores. That's why I'm here. And I'm excited to have more conversations with you all. Remember, as we go through this spring and this crowded season of campaigning, remember that Mario Rosser came here for you today. And Mario Rosser is committed to doing everything I can to not only strengthen the bonds here in Harlem, but as we enter a new decade of accelerated growth in the continent, of all neighborhoods in New York, Harlem needs to be the neighborhood that spearheads the collaboration between our sister cities within the continent, in Accra, in Kumasi, in Abidjan, in Lagos. Those are our sister cities. And this is the time to lean in to make sure that the New York relationship between those cities is the strongest relationship of any city, of any cities in the world. We can do that right now. And that's what I'm committed to. Um, I want you all to consider joining me, to learn more about my campaign and what we're specifically, specifically going to do. 
right now. You can text Harlem to 55444. Again, text Harlem to 55444 and learn more about what we're building in this neighborhood. We're in it to win it. I thank you all for the opportunity. And you can also learn more by going to MarioForHarlem.nyc. MarioForHarlem.nyc. Thank you all and have a great conference. Thank you, Brother Mario. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, next on our agenda, on our program is, uh, I think we have Assembly Member Charles Fall. Assembly Member Fall, are you I on? Oh, you're here. I am here. Can you hear me? All right. Wow. It is such a pleasure to have you join us. So we are really excited no. to have Charles on, Assembly Member Charles Fall, because he's the first African immigrant American born to African immigrant parents. So we are so excited to have you. We worked really you know, hard on your campaign and we was, were so happy that you're still here. So it's exciting to have you on. Please speak to us. What does this uh, day Black History Month represent to you as an American born to African immigrant parents? Absolutely. First, I just want to thank you Bukola, for having me and the United African Coalition for hosting this event. You know, I wanted to get on a little early, but I was just leaving a previous engagement well, for me, African history is uh, an opportunity. Well, this month of Black history is really an opportunity to uh, look at those that were here before us. Think about um, all the work that they've done, the sacrifices they have made, and where we are today. You know, and I think about, you know, if it wasn't for those efforts in the past, my parents wouldn't have the opportunity um, to come here um, from West Africa to live the American dream. You know, some of you know, you know, my mom worked as a teller in a bank. She worked her way up and now she's a CEO of that bank. You know, my father, he was driving a cab, worked his way and he owns a couple small businesses. And the whole idea just goes back to hard work and um, persistence. Um, and if it wasn't for that, I would have the opportunity to serve you in the state assembly. But there's still a lot of work to do. And, and I'm committed to that work, um, you know, since I've uh, been elected and prior to being elected. Um, and at a time now where um, our community is um, hurting uh, from COVID, um, you know, whether it's um, access to vaccines or um, getting testing or, you know, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, file unemployment claims or, you know, finding a new job. Um, I just want to let folks know that, you know, please um, see my office as a resource. Um, you know, we're here for you. And, you know, and want to be helpful. So, you know, with that being said, um, Bukla, thank you so much for having me. It's always uh, good to see you, good to see all of you. And um, I'm just happy I'm able to join you guys uh, today. I know, thank you. I know your time is very tight. I just want to just speak to you one more. Issue. I mean, one of the things now for African immigrants that have been here for so many years and, and the new ones who feel Wait. that it's important to participate in civic engagement, the importance Beautiful. Can you hear me? Can you repeat that one more time? I missed the first part. I'm sorry. Hey, the what message do you have for African immigrants who still think that they can stand on the stand line, that they don't have to participate in the political process? What message? I mean, you represent that for us, and we're really so happy to have you represent, you know, the African immigrant community in, in, in the, um, I'm sorry, in the assembly. So what message would you say, what would you say to African immigrants out there who are still thinking that? It's not important to vote. Yeah, no. So one, it, it's um, it's definitely you know, with all due respect to people that may not that that didn't, uh, it's not important to be involved. Um, I respectfully disagree because you know you have to remember if if you're not involved in um, you know, politics, local politics, um, you have to remember politics impacts the policy we see. All right, and I'm gonna give you an example at the federal level. Um, when President Obama was the president of the United States, um, his politics reflected on the type of policy we saw at the federal government, right? And then when President Trump became president, it was a complete reverse of what we all believe in. You know, Africa was pretty much um, disrespected so much in the previous administration, and they did not honor a lot of the things like, you know, for instance, like, you know, Harriet Tubman's supposed to be on a $20 bill and I was supposed to be printed a while ago and all that was delayed, you know? So those are little things that we have to remember. Politics does play a big part in what policy will look like. And I think the federal government is such a good example of what we see there. And 
it's also a reminder that if you are on the sidelines, it's very similar to that notion. If you don't vote, you vote, you know, then, you know, your, your, your voice isn't, uh, um, doesn't, your voice is not heard really, right? And, and every vote does make a difference. You know, some people may sit there and say, my vote does not make a difference. There have been elections that have been decided by one vote, five votes, 10 votes. Every vote does make a difference. And not only does your vote work of uh, matter, but, you know, the people that you talk to, that you could help influence toward one way, those are other votes too, you know? So you really do have a lot of power as a citizen and as an individual um, <clears throat> to, you know, get involved. And if you're not a citizen um, and you can't vote, there's still other things you can do to be involved in a process. You know, you could help get information out, help educate, um, you know, your our brothers and sisters out there, you know? So, you know, I know some people, you know, they may not have the citizenship and they can't vote, but you still have a role to play to be part of uh, the system, right? Um, so I just kind of want to, you know, emphasize how critically important it is to um, be involved because if we're not involved, it does really impact our kids at the end of the day. Well, thank you so much. You know, it's good to have you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. So right. that's why the United African Coalition was actually founded in 2013. We were not planning to, to establish this organization. We were founded because some of the candidates, not, some of some members of the African community just stepped up to uh, run for office. And Dr. Motosho was actually one of them and it's on this uh, line. So we, United African Coalition was uh, ignited uh, because of the lack of political representation in the African community that we pay taxes, uh, but we're not represented. So our goal is to make sure that our constituency involved, you know, civically, they engage civically to also ensure that they vote, that your vote do count. I mean, we can't just continue to live in this country uh, and pay taxes and not participate in, you know, who represent our interests. So on that note, I would like to call on uh, Senator Parker. Senator Parker is next. Senator Parker, are you on? I see uh, that Ruben is here. Ruben, can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat repeat that? I, I can hear you. Sorry, I was asking Senator Parker to come on. Is he is he is he on standby? Is he here? Senator Parker? I, oh, I'm not on his staff. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that, that's okay. That's okay. I'm with the assemblyman. Right. Okay. My bad. Let me, I don't see him here. Um, okay. Oh, Asmahan. Asmahan is just joining us. Fantastic. She's actually next to our Senator Parker. Asmahan, it's such a pleasure to have you here. So Asmahan is the, with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And she is just, uh, you know, she's also uh, from, I mean, she's African-American, was of African descent, directly of African descent. And she, you know, she serves the African community so well. And she's a liaison, you know, with the African community at the mayor's office. So she's our go-to person. Like anything that happens in our community that we need help with, Asmahan has been really, really wonderful. And we really thank you for joining us, Asmahan. Please go ahead. What does this day represent to you as an African immigrant or African-American and, um, you know? Yeah, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Bukola, for that introduction. Um, yeah, as Bukola said, my name is Asmahan. Um, I work as a community liaison or other terms organizer with the New York City Mayor's Office um, of Immigrant Affairs. And we're one of many mayoral offices in the city. Um, but our office works directly with immigrant communities. Um, and, you know, as Bukola mentioned, um, I am directly of African descent. Um, my family and I are originally from Somalia. And so um, an event like this is really important and getting to have a position at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is really important to me as, you know, Black history, um, as well as just African history specifically, um, is something that I've been always acutely aware of. And it's something that has completely um, influence the way that I do my work in the office, right? So um, to even be here today is such a full circle moment for me because part of my work is working directly with Black immigrant communities, right? And making sure we raise the visibility of Black communities um, and lift up their voices and also highlight the social issues that impact them. So um, to answer that question, I would say this day means today and just in this entire month, every February is just a moment for me to revisit 
the sort of tenants and foundations that really center the work that I do day in and day out with Black immigrant communities. So I'm so honored to be here. I'm so happy to uh, be part of this event during the closeout of Black History Month this February. Um, but I also wanted to take an opportunity just to share some resources and information um, because, you know, as we talk about legacies, we also need to talk about what's happening presently, right? So the work of our predecessors and, and our leaders um, that we highlight during this month never ends. And so as part of that, it's so important to carry that work along. And so what I wanted to share today is just to let you all know that our mission, you know, as the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is to advocate and empower immigrant communities, especially during this time and making sure that their voices are heard and their concerns are being met. Um, especially now during this pandemic, you know, our number one priority is making sure that folks are um, directly connected to the resources that they need. Um, so I just wanted to um, give you guys a, a, a link or a, a quick thing that is important to have on hand that our office does. So um, we, at our website at nyc.gov slash immigrant slash coronavirus, you'll see our immigrant resource guide um, that provides critical resources for folks that range from food access to healthcare. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but in general, also put my contact information. I'm really looking forward to connecting to, uh, with you all. And I really want to take, uh, thank the United African Coalition for inviting me to speak briefly this afternoon. Um, and I'll put everything in the, um, uh, the chat. But thank you all so much. And, and uh, it's an incredible inv event to be uh, invited to. Thank you, Asmahan. Pleasure to have you join us. Mac, who is next on our on our program, please? As I'm trying to find this uh, list again. Um. Certainly, I believe uh, if uh, Jean Adams is here, uh, okay. Jean was next on our lineup. All right. Jean, welcome to the program. Can you hear me? Okay, I suppose Jean hasn't arrived yet. Oh, I see. Um, oh, okay. So you said Jean. So with that, I think we're, um, if Senator Parker's not here, I think we're- um... Senator Parker is not, and also Michael Blake is also, can you possibly reach out to uh, Michael to see if he's still coming on while we're trying to see uh, what to do next? Certainly, All right. absolutely. Oh, on that note, um, your Royal Highness, are you still there? Do you want to just say a quick goodbye? I know you have to check out. If you can hear me, please just say uh, a quick goodbye and then we'll, we'll continue with the program. Hello, Shang Bomi. Okay. So once we enter the next session, it's Gonna be a bit tough. Just give me a quick sec. Let me see if I can find them. Hello. Okay. Otherwise, uh, Gloria Wilson. Gloria, I okay. I see Gloria. Gloria, okay. I see you now. Thank you. I know you. Check out. So please just a uh, quick goodbye. We appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are very, I'm very happy, delighted to be part of this program. And I wish this, uh, I wish you very much successful this kind of program. And I wish everybody um, uh, happy, uh, uh, happy uh, and uh, more and more, more things to, to come in, in our life. Thank you very much. And I wish to be in the next one as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, my madam. Bye-bye. Okay, she going. Thank you. So Gloria, Gloria Delan Wilson, Gloria, are you on? I see you on the lineup. Gloria, can you hear me? So Gloria is um, a veteran journalist and uh, you know a, a friend of mine for, for many years. Um, Gloria is going Bookie, to- can you paint. hear me now? Yes, I can hear you All now. Right. Thank you, sis. <laughs> Gloria is gonna be paint. Uh, I'm so, it's such a pleasure to have you. I, I'm so grateful that you're here. Uh, so Gloria is going to be paying tribute to the Queen, Cicely Tyson. Gloria, please go ahead. 
Gloria Dulan okay. Wilson. Everybody, thank you for having me on. Before I pay tribute to the queen, I have to pay tribute to a very long personal friend and ally, Bookie Shoniga, who used to be my running buddy when we were running the streets, getting all of the scoops, interviewing Jerry John Rawlings and the other dignitaries at the UN. So Bookie, I just wanted to let you know how much of a pleasure it is that we've been reunited after not having seen each other for a million years. Right. Um, Okay, so this is in tribute to Cicely Tyson. Uh, the main thing that most people don't know about Cicely Tyson is that um, she actually had, she was the, actually the first black woman to have a major starring role in a dramatic television series. In addition to the other things that, that she's be, been considered famous for. She was a groundbreaking model and actress known for her outstanding portrayals of strong, intelligent, beautiful black women and her refusal to participate in films that she viewed as demeaning to the black community. Cicely was born in December. She was born December 19th, 1924, two parents from the Caribbean island of Nevis, which made her an adventurous Sagittarius with strong ethics and values. She was raised in a devoutly religious household in Harlem. And as she said in her biography, she couldn't wait to get out of there. She was discovered by the fashion editor at Ebony Magazine, which one was one of the biggest magazines once upon a time in the black community in America and quickly rose to the top of the modeling world. But in 1957, she began acting in off Broadway productions and eventually got her first film role in a movie called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And you can check that out on YouTube. It's well worth the watch. In 1963, as I mentioned before, the TV series that she was in was called East Side, West Side, and she starred opposite George C. Scott. They only kept it on for one season because the people in the South did not like the fact that there was a black woman on TV on a regular basis. Uh, her next notable role came as Rebecca Morgan in the popular and critically acclaimed film Sounder for which she achieved an Academy Award for Best Actress. And that was in 1972. And then two years later, she starred in a movie called the, a TV series actually, called The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman where she went from a slave to a freed woman, to a bride, a mother, and finally portraying a 100-year-old woman who was still living during the civil rights movement in the South and who stood up to the descendants of her former slave monsters. She won two Emmy Awards. The other roles in other major TV shows included Roots, which is on now, The Women of Brewster Place, House of Cards, and How to Get Away with Murder. But since she refused to play roles demeaning black women, she did not receive the work that she should have from the mainstream movie uh, moguls, but she persevered. And she was eventually identified as an icon by the mainstream media, already, even though African-Americans already revered and honored her. In her later years, she was awarded multiple accolades, including an honorary Academy Award in the 90s, Tyler Perry, who was one of my heroes and who was a longtime fan of Cicely, began giving her roles in his movies, especially the popular Medea series. And then President Barack Obama, who was also a fan, gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 1992, Cicely was inducted into Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc., which is, by the way, my sorority. And she was honored by Susan Taylor, who was also a member of that sorority in, 19, in, in 2018 for her work, her art history, and for her perseverance, and for representing Black women as beautiful and as honorable. Unfortunately, our soror Cicely Tyson made her transition to the Ancestor Angels on January the 28th of this year leaving a legacy of art and activism and love for black people. She was 96 years old. Now, I've seen people half her age that didn't look half as good as she did. 
I had an opportunity to interview Cicely on several occasions. I was highly honored to sit next to her during the um, homegoing celebration for Dr. Betty Shabazz and uh, so many other times that I've had to be, had the honor of being in her presence as also with uh, John Lewis. We have a legacy here that stretches from Africa to here and our gene pool runs very deep. The problem is that we are not doing as well as we should in terms of making sure that not only our kids know this, but the elders know this as well. Uh, we come from an oral tradition in Africa. And one of the problems is that when we complain about the fact that nobody knows our history, it's because we are just coming late to the game of writing it down ourselves. It's part of our tradition and we've had to make an adaptation. But uh, Bookie, I just really wanted to thank you for bringing me on. I also wanted to let um, folks know that this is the second go round with black and African people and the diaspora trying to unite. The first time we did it was in the 60s. I was a junior in college. And once they found out that we were going to be able to be successful, they did everything they could to undermine it. So it took another 40 years for us to figure out that we were supposed to work together. And also just to let you know, I am a proud graduate of Lincoln University, proudly say, and I'll tell that to Bucky every time we gave you your first president, Azikwe, and we gave Ghana Nkrumah. So thank you very much. And you all stay blessed and stay eclectically black. And I will put a link to my blog, Eclectically Black News, in the chat line for anybody who's looking to see what we're doing. Last thing, Bucky, I know you know how, how I am. I'm yeah. in Philadelphia. Right. And I wanted to know that I wanted you to know that I am also with the Mayor's Commission on African and Caribbean Immigrant Affairs. And Philadelphia has a whole trade mission that goes between, Black Philadelphians, by the way, that goes between here and Africa. And we are in the process of building and what we call Africa Town, which will be a centralized place for people coming from all over Africa that they can go to as they would if they were going to Chinatown or any place else. Wow. So we have a very strong uh, African and Caribbean, not only population, but they're in government, they're elected officials, and they're doing all kinds of wonderful things. Thank you. The reason I say wow is that the stars are in alignment because we're doing the same, we're trying to do the same thing in New York. We're trying to create a little Africa in New York, mm -hmm. a place where people can come and experience our culture and all the richness of our culture and everything. So this is great. So let, let's talk on that and see how we can all collaborate. Well, there's definitely synergy. And also the clip that you did from 2015 was from the Odunde Festival. The Festival, yes. I was there. Oh, I, I wish I had known you were there. <laughs> And I just also saw you in November, um, you know, actually, yeah, September and October ending. Yes. Well, the outreach for the Biden-Harris uh, campaign. So we we're so happy that, you know, they won, right? Uh, and tell Brother Chooks, uh, I was on the uh, Zoom call when we were dealing with getting out the vote back in October and, and, and November as well. Thank you, sister. So, good, to, good to have you on. So, so it's so good to be with, with people who know what the heck is going on. You stay blessed. You're well. Sorry, guys, <laughs> for the uh, reminiscent. And <laughs> we apologize. You know, all good. So now we have Roscoe Boyd. Roscoe is going to pay tribute to Honorable John Robert Lewis. Roscoe is uh, part of the NAACP. I believe you're uh, the current VP to the board. Please, Roscoe, go ahead, please. Rukala, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you and the United African Coalition for the awesome work that you do and this wonderful presentation today. It is indeed uh, something wonderful when we can dwell together in unity. You know, it's often called, John, it is often said that John Lewis is one of the most courageous persons the civil rights movement has ever produced. He dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he called the beloved community here in America. His dedication to the highest ethical standards and moral principles won him the admiration of many of his colleagues on both sides of the aisle at the United States Congress. Congressman John Lewis was born to a family of sharecroppers outside of Troy, Alabama, at a time when African-Americans 
in the South were subjected to segregation in education, as well as in public facilities and across the nation. We were also prevented from voting by systemic discrimination and intimidation. Now, though he was surrounded by two loving parents, a sister, brothers, as well as plenty of cousins, their love could not protect him from the unholy oppression waiting just outside that family circle. Unchecked and unrestrained violence and government sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare, true terror. After attending segregated schools in Pike County, Alabama, he graduated from the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee, and completed a bachelor's degree in religion and philosophy at this university, an HBCU. It was there that as a student, he began participating in sit-ins at segregated lunch counters to protest racism and segregation. He received extensive training that prepared him for one of the most cruel expressions of hatred to abuse a person who has taken no action against you and refused, refuses to fight or defend themselves. Lewis and his friends sat silently at lunch counters. They were harassed, they were beaten, and they were arrested. In 1961, Lewis joined his friends on a freedom ride and they challenged segregation on interstate buses across the country. One of the important things to remember is that during these years, he founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also he known as founded and was a leader of the student movement for civil rights. In 1968, when the country was losing John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, excuse me, and Martin Luther King Jr., this was a personal friend to him. And of course, it had a personal effect on his life, but he persevered and remained dedicated as a director of the Voter Education Project. And he helped to bring nearly 4 million new minority voters into the democratic process. Like so many young people today, uh, John Lewis was someone who needed to find a place, and he did. He found a place within government and within leadership, and found a way to speak truth to power. Lewis began his time in government when President Jimmy Carter appointed him as head of the Federal Volunteer Agency, Action. In 1981, he won a seat on the Alabama City Council. And in 1986, he won a seat in Congress in the same state where his parents had been prevented from voting many years prior. One of the things that Congressman Lewis would say is that ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what he would call good trouble, necessary trouble. And voting and participating in the democratic process are key to this. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you and I have in a democratic society. And we must use it because it is not guaranteed and we can lose it, he would say. He represented his district for more than 30 years, sitting on the House Budget Committee and House Ways and Means Committee. During his tenure, he received multiple honorary degrees and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He was an advocate for many causes, including health insurance reform and global human rights, and was even arrested on one occasion for protesting the obstruction of aid to Dafar in Sudan. Shortly before his death years later, he wrote in an essay that was published the day of his funeral service last year in the New York Times. From his perspective, there is nothing more powerful than taking action. He said, when you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state, it is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what he called the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. You know, when Bukala asked me to present on John Lewis, I was reminded of what it means to remember to bring together our bodies 
and to bring together our knowledge of each other. I wanna thank you, Bacola, for putting together such an amazing event today that focuses on African-Americans within the context of the greater diaspora and the connections that we have to each other now and into the future as the sixth of the bodies around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roscoe. Thank you. This is really powerful and eloquent. It's, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you're able to, to join us to pay tribute to Assemblyman, I mean, no, sorry, Congressman John Lewis. Thank you so much. So uh, I have to apologize to former Assemblyman Michael Blake because he, he's on our flyer. And while I was editing the program, I omitted his name by accident. Just really, I'm really, really sorry. So, Assemblyman Blake, are you are you on now? Can you uh, do you, Mac? Is he on? Is he able to join us? He's he's able. I think he's able to join us. Uh, he's not on quite yet, but should be on, I believe, momentarily. Okay, momentarily. I'm I'm really sorry about that error. That was really terrible. So, I don't believe uh, Senator Parker is on yet. I don't see him here. While we're moving right along, um, do we see, is Jean Adams with us? No. Don't so what, while we're waiting for, um, okay, Matt, can you please send him the link? Do you have the link? Um, Michael, uh, can you send uh, Assemblyman Blake the link to this? Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, guys, I'm just gonna wait to, uh, for, for Michael to join us for a quick second so that we can do uh, uh, maybe some closing thoughts while we're waiting for, um, I don't believe Senator Parker is gonna be able to join us, we'll see. Otherwise, thank you guys for hanging, hanging with us. So we, this is running smoothly. Yep, you should be jumping on right now, just one second. Okay, should be thank you guys for hanging out. This is how we can build together stronger. We're so powerful together. The colossal talent, the cultural richness, it's just unparalleled. And we have not leveraged that enough. And I hope this is a new beginning of our partnership with our uh, you know, African diaspora uh, sisters and brothers. This is really great. Thank you all for, for honoring us by you know, hitting the call. We appreciate you all. Okay, I see uh, Brother Milton is still there. Thank you for staying the course. I appreciate you coming on. So please uh, give us a few minutes to, to wrap up so they can be part of our closing uh, thoughts. Or you want me to say something right now? Uh, yeah, please chime in while we're waiting for uh, Michael to come on, please. Thank you. Well, I mean, as I pointed in the beginning, this is the kind of thing that we need to have on an annual basis. All the speakers recognize the power of Africa, not only historically, but even in practical terms, uh, how Africa in fact built the wealth, not only of the United States, by the way, of essentially every country, every region in the world, is from either the resources that have been extracted from Africa historically, minerals and natural resources. It's the labor primarily of Africans and African descendants that built the world. Britain became the premier capitalist power in the world out of the extraction of resources from Africa and labor from Africa. And then the wealth spread from Britain to what became the United States and then the other countries that industrialized later, all of them extracting resources from Africa. Europeans had a conference in 1884, the Berlin Conference, to partition Africa. So in other words, they said, we as Europeans, we should not fight amongst ourselves. Let's sit. If you're going to steal a continent, the entire continent, let's do it like gentlemen. <laughs> and that's Sweet. how they partitioned Africa. And they secured resources, they secured free labor, and that has disrupted the development of Africa up to the 21st century. Africans on the continent and our sisters and brothers spread all over the world 
including here in the United States. So the key thing is that the Europeans have always known the value of Africa, and they created this narrative of uh, demonization of Africans to the extent that it made even Africans on their motherland <laughs> ashamed of being Africans, and Africans all over the world ashamed of being Africans as well. I always recommend a very strong five-minute statement by Brother Malcolm X. It's called, You Can't Hate the Roots of a Tree Without Hating the Tree. And anybody can listen to it on YouTube. And Malcolm says that the Europeans were very clever. While they were stealing resources from Africa, they were projecting the image of Africa as savages and backward in order to divide Africans. And that's been done very effectively. And it still continues today when we see negative depictions of Africans or descendants of Africa here in the United States to make them think that they're lesser human beings and to make them more willing to accept exploitation and abuse. But once they find out their true knowledge and history, then they become intellectually empowered. And one of the speakers said that earlier too. It's big, it, to, to really gain true liberation, it has to start with the mind. Once the mind is unlocked, then you cannot stop Africans from achieving individually and collectively. I would like to highly recommend one book before I, before I get off. The African Origins of Civilization by Czech Anta Job. And Job is spelled D-I-O-P. I believe every African, every human being should actually read that book. Yes. So that's how I would like to end. And I keep well, thank, you. thanking you once again, Sister Bobby, for putting this together. Yeah. Can you put the book in the chat so that we can uh, have Yes, it of course, time. I will. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Have a, 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 a real good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you. So I have now Honorable Michael Blake that's always supporting everything we do. And we love him and we also support everything that he does. Uh, Assemblyman Michael Blake, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you uh, join us on this historic occasion. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, always good to see you, my sister. Peace to my fellow kings and queens. Uh, and uh, great to be in your presence um, as we, of course, celebrate um, not just Black history, but also our African history, because you can't separate the two. They are intertwined and they are one. Uh, I, I know there was recognition and libation uh, on earlier as well. Uh, Brother Milton, wonderful to listen to your words just now. Uh, thank you for your leadership and what you do. Uh, uh, Brother Boyd, I'm loving your background. That's strong right there. I'm going to have to borrow that background uh, for my own later on. Uh, and, and of course, to, to Bookie, uh, we, we are grateful for you, my, my sister, for your continual leadership, your support, uh, the United African Coalition, which has always been there for, for me, and I will be there for you. Uh, I see my, my Dr. Bola, uh, my, my brother, uh, always good to be in your presence. And Charles, I hope you are feeling better. Uh, to Sister Reed and others, and of course, Mac from my team on the line. Let me be very brief. Um, the uh, reflection specifically uh, around the honoring of John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, and Good Trouble. You know, I had the honor many times over my life uh, to be in his presence. I uh, was grateful to be in his presence when thinking about up in Martha's Vineyard uh, when we were able to have an event around I Bolt, um, the time we spent um, within DC. Uh, his chief of staff was a fraternity brother of, of mine, uh, Michael Collins. Uh, and all the reflections is what, something I want people to appreciate. The Greeks had two definitions of time, Kronos and Kairos. And as we think about Congressman Lewis, he used the Kronos being the chronological time to make a Kairos of the moment. And that has been our history as African people. That is our history as Black people. You know, remind people that Black History Month started as Negro History Week and the reflection of Carter G. Woodson. But all of this is intertwined in who we came from. And so it is impossible for us to ignore who we are and what we are and what we will be. In this year of 2021, being the 100th anniversary of Greenwood and what happened in Tulsa and the burning down of our people and the businesses that's there. Uh, let us rise from the ashes and do more on this year. Let us re reflect on what has happened as Brother Senator Warnock says that we are battling two pandemics of COVID-19 and COVID-1619. And it is impossible for us to not appreciate 1619 without appreciating the origins of Africa, of where we were taken from 
our motherland. And so let us be attentive of that um, as we recognize good trouble and the good trouble that we will cause. Uh, lastly, uh, I say thank you. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what you shall do. And thank you for all that you're doing on this journey. Uh, it is not about us just having black history in February. It is about us realizing that black history happens every single day. Uh, and how do we continue to demonstrate that and reflect on that? And how do we use this moments to teach everyone about the culture of Africa uh, and how it's intertwined um, in our blackness, it's intertwined in our culture, it's intertwined in our intelligence, it's intertwined in our excellence. You cannot speak of black excellence without speaking of Africa. And so I, I come to you, say thank you. Uh, it is great to be in your presence. I, I won't be with you long uh, because I wanted us to come and say hello and, and recognize and show that love. Uh, but you already know, whether it be United African Coalition or anyone else associated, anything you ever need, I'll always be there for you. Um, God bless you. Happy Black History Month and happy celebration to our people of Africa. Bookie, back to you. Thank you so much, powerful and short. Thank you. We appreciate you and all the best, brother. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Amato Shaw uh, is the co-founder of the United African Coalition. It's actually one of the reasons why this organization was actually uh, was born. If I, if I could use that word, United African Coalition was given birth to by the, the bravery uh, of someone like Dr. Amato Shaw who stood up in, uh, uh, stepped up in 2016 and ran for District 16, um, City Council in the Bronx. He is the reason, the main reason why United African Commission came to be. Everybody's in the car. And who's knocked out next to you? <laughs> yeah. Well, good afternoon. No, no, no. It's my daughter who is uh, here with me. I see. Hello. Okay. okay please go ahead, Dr. Moto Show, and um, thank you for joining well, us. Thank you. Uh, for my brothers and sisters uh, with uh, African heritage, I just want to wish everyone well and uh, peaceful. Um, let me just use this opportunity to say thank you to Buki, who is the executive director of uh, United African Coalition, and also to our honorable chairman, um, Charles Cooper, and all our elected officials who have also uh, spoken so eloquently uh, this afternoon and all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, because I believe uh, folks have joined several parts of the world with different time zones. Having said that, let me just use this single opportunity um, to challenge a notion of an African brother who is running for governorship in one of the states here in the United States, who came up on here and said, oh, they should abolish uh, Black History Month. For folks that are uninformed, um, we should use this opportunity to train them, to teach them, to educate them, to encourage them to listen and understand the historical value of where we come from, how we got here, and where we're going. And most importantly, on the shoulders of whose we stood uh, and able to be able to do what we're doing. Um, thank you, Buki, again for that uh, wonderful, uh, I'm humble with the introduction, uh, which yes, I'm privileged to have been in the district. I've not known any other district other than the Bronx in New York City since I've uh, migrated to this country. Uh, about a quarter of a century ago. And um, yes, I did run for office in 2013. Uh, but prior to then and up till now, uh, I'm still very active in the community, but also encouraging Africans in the diaspora, meaning that uh, if you just came in here yesterday or you've been here longer than myself or you have plans of coming in, I'm so excited about uh, the dispensation that uh, and the recognition that Africans and African in the diaspora and all over, especially the black race are having now with the visibility. We are not talking about reparation. That's a different topic entirely, but this is a special event that I just want to say thank you to everyone on this panel and uh, Madam Buki. Thank you so much for the, for putting this together. 
Thank As you. you can see, I'm also on the road uh, uh, doing community service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, let me, let, me, now, let me underscore that. I mean, I am not, I'm not nothing pretty much without, without you guys honoring the call. When we call and everyone hit the call, that's where the power is. So I really appreciate everyone. United African Coalition appreciates everyone that come to honor us. To, and you know, staying course uh, through throughout this event, we, we really appreciate you. So I don't believe there is anyone else on this line that would like to. Uh... Dana, would you like to chime in as we as we close out? Sister Dana, thank you. I see you. Absolutely. Um, this is so great. I mean, we're at the close of Black History Month, um, which they gave us a month, but we know it's it's hour by hour, minute by minute. It's really good to see um, old friends, new friends. Um, and for those that know me, um, I'm just passionate about bringing our diaspora together. They tried to separate us, but it's not possible. Um, and my hat's off to you, uh, Bukola. You always bring us together. Um, I enjoy working with you and the messages, the work you do, um, and just bringing us together. This is our community. Um, we have to take ownership of it. We can't sit on the sidelines and wait. We know what happens then. We get moved, we get displaced. Um, and so we're in this together. And as uh, Ray McGuire said, together we rise. We are an economic force. Um, we are the biggest consumers. Um, we just fail to understand that because of the systemic um, divisiveness. And we're not gonna let that happen anymore because of forums like this. Um, Roscoe, I haven't seen you um, since our last journey, but um, that's why we need forums like this and leaders like Bukola um, and these organizations so that um, we do rise together and we stay together um, and, and work with all. So um, thank you for including me. Um, I'm, I'm here on this journey. This is our journey and, and we'll do it together. Thank you, Dana. Bookie, can I say something before you close? I was actually going to call you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually going to call you. That's the, that's the spirit talking. Yeah, go ahead, please. I was about to call you. No, I think it's I think it's wonderful. I think there's always been synergy between New York and Philadelphia among Black people, and I think we definitely need to enhance that as much as we possibly can, because there's too much going on right now. Uh, we talked about the power of politics. Uh, I was getting ready to write a scathing letter to the idiot who had the audacity to say that we need to do away with Black History Month. And I think whenever we see these kinds of insults, we need to definitely respond and make sure that they understand that we're watching them. We cannot take it uh, silently. We cannot afford to allow what has happened in the last four years to continue. And we have to make sure that not only does that get, uh, uh, what can I say, stopped, but that whatever harm that has been done as a result of the previous four years are now remedied. And yes, I am talking reparations because reparations are due Africa and they're due African-Americans because we were oppressed by the same people. We just got dropped off one place geographically and they took over what you had over there in the homelands. The other thing is that um, I wanted to give greetings to my brother Milton Alamadi because I used to write for the Black Star News and, and let him know how much, how happy I am every time I see his face and every time I see, read anything that he's done. Thank you, sister. <laughs> and so, how about Igani? Zuri Sana, stay well, yeah. sister. Thank Watch you. Yeah. Not a problem. And, and I think that we definitely need to be moving in that direction. Every, this first Tuesday of every month here in Philadelphia, the Mayor's Commission on African and Caribbean Immigrant meet for two hours without fail dealing with issues, whether it's local or international, having to do with Africans, whether they're here or in, in Africa. And we're very serious about what we do. And what I'd like to do is send you the information so that you guys can chime in. And I'll send you the Zoom link for it because I think we need to be definitely working in concert with each other. Thank you. And that's to you too, Milton, my brother. So. <laughs> Thank you, so Charles, uh, Thank you, Charles Thank are you still there? Uh, Chairman, can you please uh, give some closing thoughts? Uh, I'm not sure if Charles is on mute. Charles, can you hear me? 
Um, yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm having. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, you want to chime in just quickly? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, first of all, I, I just want to once again thank the uh, panelists um, and, and yourself. Um, you, you, know, you know, this was meant to happen. Um, the gathering of um, a collection of folks uh, from different parts with different skill sets, but with one goal in mind, which is the empowerment of black and brown people. And we, we are at a crossroads right now. And this, this is an opportunity for us to collectively put our energy together and move our people forward, no matter whether um, uh, we're on the continent or in a diaspora. And, you know, I, I pray and, and I'm hopeful that this is not the end of it, um, that gatherings like this uh, will happen more often and as a people, because at the end of the day, we're all one, you know, no, no matter what country or what region um, um, you, you come from, we, we, we are all one and we are all part of one collective. Um, and because we're all part of one collective, no matter whether you break us apart, uh, whether you take us to the Americas or uh, you take us you know, far east, you know, at the end of the day, we'll always be connected with one consciousness. And because of that, we'll always find ourselves back home um, to this one continuum. Um, and, and this, and this is, this is the start of it. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful and I'm thankful for um, everyone that got the opportunity to participate um, in this event. And once again, um, thank you, Bokola. Your heart is so big and, um, and we, we, we need more of you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairman Charles Cooper. Roscoe, please, some closing thoughts quickly, brother. Thank you, Bukola. I just wanted to say again how wonderful this event is and what is possible in this moment. You know, sometimes we forget yes. that the power is in the seed. And this is the seed of something that I believe is, is much greater than we could envision right now separately, but collectively, the power that's on your panel and the power that is in your audience is a great thing. And so I want to encourage you and stand with you as you continue to build our coalition, as you continue to unite our people, as you continue to sow seeds of grace and peace and unity among us all. So thank you for inviting me and allowing me to share today as well. Thank you so much. So this this event is not would not have been possible. That sounds like a cliche, but it's really real that we could not have done this successfully without Mac Makishima. Mac, would you please say something? Mac is this volunteer that's been working with me day and night, not just on this event, but in the past. So Mac was the former actually staffer with Michael Blake. So I, I kind of like that was how we met. And then we connected from there and I kind of stole him from him like anytime I have. Mark, please say something, please. I really, really appreciate you. Yeah. Of course. Well, thank you, Bukola. Uh, and thank you all for, for having me join you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's always a pleasure to work with Bukola. It was a pleasure to work with her in the assembly um, where we you know, collaborated often. It's a pleasure to work together with her now. Um, you know, well, now that I have, uh, you know, no more affiliation with the government and, you know, have some uh, sort of more free reign to sort of associate. Um, you know, it's really an honor to be sort of a guest in, in this event and to sort of be here with you in a really important uh, historical month um, for this community, but also just to, uh, to sort of help sort of illustrate themes that will go beyond this month um, and that are relevant every, every day of the year. Um, and uh, I, I'm honored to be a guest here. I'm honored to, uh, to be with you all. And uh, thank you, Bukola, for including me in this. You're welcome. So I'm going to uh, close this out by quoting. I've been learning so much from uh, watching Black History Month. PBS, shout out. PBS is just my school on everything that is Black History Month or Black History. So one of my favorite quotes among thousands of quotes is, goes like this, and I quote, although it's 
the end, but it's not over because black seeds keep on growing. End quote, by at least his, his slip, March 7, 19, 1973. That was, a quote from Ellie's Hislip, a powerful showman, journalist, uh, curator, I mean, you name it. I was just so mesmerized when I watched these, this man's work and the platform they gave to the Black people on television to showcase our talent for, for years until the evil power that be American government at that time shut the show down. They just did not like the power that this man was showing how black people, what black people can do. Anyhow, so that was a quote from him. And this was in March 7th, 1973, when the show was shut down. And Ellis Hayslip uh, was born in 19, uh, actually it was, it was it at the age of 61. I don't have his uh, you know, date of birth here, but very powerful. It's still showing on PBS. It, it's actually, the, the show is called the, Soul, S-O-U-L, that is it, that's it, that was the show, it's really powerful. For everyone, I mean to everyone, from my heart to yours, I'm, I'm very grateful for what's important are the people that show up for you. I am nothing if you guys don't show up for me and you're always showing up and I appreciate all of you. And uh, United African Coalition continues to, you know, charge forward, carrying the torch. Thank you so much guys and you have a good afternoon. In New York, it's good after it's afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. And anything for.